Our kitchens are full of so many tools that just have one purpose, or do they? Let's use common kitchen tools in different ways. I'm in the mood for a fiesta, so today it's guacamole. You can find a bunch of specialty tools for slicing and dicing avocados, but if you have a wire rack, you can use that. With the skin on, we'll just press it through. What I found helps here is to slide it through. Cleanup's really easy. You can quickly rinse it off, or I even throw mine in the dishwasher. In my kitchen, I tend to stay away from tools that just have one purpose, like a citrus juicer. You can achieve the same juicing action just by squeezing with a pair of tongs. For extra leverage, place that citrus near the middle in a firm squeeze. And when it comes to lemons, I like to squeeze them right side up to avoid those seeds. Your slicer can be a great go-to for herbs. I'm working with cilantro, but this works great on parsley, basil, just about anything. Most of the times you're mashing guacamole with a fork, but if you're dealing with a big batch, reach for that potato masher. These juicers are a handy way to squeeze as much as you can out of those lemons and limes. But there's another kitchen device to help give you the most juice output. My good friend, Microwave. 20 seconds should do it. 20 to 30 seconds heating that up will get those juices flowing. Rock and roll to break up all the fibers inside. Ooh, it's already dripping out. Softer, easier to squeeze, and way more juice. This also can make it easier when you're hand juicing. The microwave is a great way to coax more juice out if your citrus is a little smaller or a little older. For smaller lemons and limes, you may need less time, like 15 to 20 seconds. Use caution, your lemon may be a little toasty. And don't throw these away, you can actually use them to clean your microwave, your sink, and other things too. Ah. Steam clean your microwave. Here's how to resuscitate some stale bread. This is an OG solution I thought we'd do a little refresher on. We'll just need a warm and toasty oven. If your oven has a warming setting, you can use that, or you can set that temp to about 300 degrees. This is where things get interesting. Run that crust under some flowing water, avoiding that exposed side. Nice and saturated on the outside crust. That water will create steam to help soften that loaf up and make it good as new. Check it after five to six minutes. You can go a little longer for a larger loaf. Set timer for six minutes. Six minutes counting down. You speak. I'm gonna get ya. You're not stale anymore. I'm gonna get ya. A little toasty on the outside, squishy in the middle. I think we've had success. Even if you're not an egg fan, this slicer can be used for other food items. Works great for slicing mushrooms. Easy peasy. After you get your slice, you can rotate your mushroom to get more of a dice, or julienne. But little matchsticks of your mushrooms. Any food that's soft enough and small, like a strawberry, works too. Most people tend to cut along that seam, but you don't want to do that. Instead, make a lateral cut along the center. With a little twist, that pit should release. With that pitted side, make another cut perpendicular to the seam. Another twist. Now you should be able to easily pop that pit right out. Since peaches have a short season, an easy way to preserve them, slice and freeze. Here's a trick to easily peel garlic. Especially when the garlic is fresh, that peel is so tight to the clove, the microwave can help loosen things up. For an average size bulb, you'll need about 20 seconds in the microwave. Not, not too hot. Just a few seconds, that little bit of steam inside there to help loosen things up. Garlic skins can get a little messy, so I like to do this on a paper towel or on a plate. Ooh, I can smell it. You may want these to cool slightly. Now it's the same peeling procedures, but that skin should be less sticky. All in one piece and not very sticky. Much easier cleanup. You can also do this on individual cloves. Just cut off the bottom first in a microwave safe bowl and you may only need 10 to 15 seconds. A can opener is a common kitchen tool, but have you tried using it on its side? This would be the traditional way to open a can. But you can also place that blade on the side. Just like that. Just crank away like butter. The lid's easy to remove and doesn't fall in. If you want, you can also strain the liquid first. Make one cut into the can and a smaller cut on the other side. Strain that liquid. Now flip to the side to take that lid off. Ta-da! Cutting a cake with a knife and all that frosting gets really messy. And mini blades aren't long enough for one clean cut. So I'm gonna set that knife aside and floss it and it's best to use unflavored. Start with a piece long enough to go across your cake. Wrap around your finger just like you are flossing your teeth. One clean cut all the way through, and to avoid any mess, slide it on out. 
When it comes to sauces, soups, and stews, microwave in shorter increments from like 30 seconds to a minute to prevent popping and explosions. Stir in between those heating intervals, it'll heat more evenly. One of the best features of a microwave that you might not be using is the power settings. Adjusting that power setting can mean more even, less messy heating. When you're melting butter, give it a head start by cutting it up into small pieces. Then just heat in small increments until it's melted. Anything with a skin or casing, you're gonna wanna poke a few holes first. You don't want that steam to build up inside, this will help it escape. You should avoid putting water by itself in the microwave. It can actually get superheated and lead to accidents. One of the most common kitchen mishaps is burning and scorched pans. For most recipes, it's a good idea to preheat that pan. Do this over medium or medium low so that pan doesn't get too scorching hot. If butter instantly browns or olive oil smokes, it's best to remove that pan and let's try again. For sauteing, you're looking for an even surface temperature of about 350 degrees. Simmering for like sauces is gonna be a little bit lower. When I cook, I like to have everything prepared and laid out. That way, while you're cooking, what's in the pan doesn't burn while you're waiting on the next ingredient. For searing in a pan, you're looking for a higher temperature of about 400 to 450. If you are cooking on a higher temperature, make sure you use the right oil. This has a higher smoking point and won't burn as easily. Of any stove top and any recipe, don't be afraid to regulate. You may need to lower the temp or raise it up to keep things at the right temperature. When it comes to cooking, sometimes you can add a little too much salt. But with a potato, we can fix that. I'm gonna get this peeled. You don't need a big potato. Just a little medium sized one will do the job. Now this goes right into that hot pot. Let this cook until it's tender. That potato's gonna absorb extra salt and liquid. This potato trick is ideal for anything liquidy like soups and stews. Once that potato is tender, you can remove it. You can also replace the lost liquid. That'll help dilute the salt as well. The best method for all around crunch is a wire rack. That way the bottom doesn't get soggy. If you're baking for that crunch, a wire rack will give you 360 crispification. Even if you're deep frying or air frying, transfer to a wire rack to preserve that texture. If you're looking to keep that crispy food warm in the oven, leave it at 170 to 200. While you're waiting to serve it, this will help from drying it out or overcooking it. It'll be good in there for about 15 to 20 minutes while you can prepare other stuff. If you're packing up for a picnic or a party, let everything cool in a single layer so steam doesn't compromise all that crispy work. One for the road. Mmm, can't go wrong with a crunchy tater tot. I love to bring an appetizer with a crispy exterior to parties and events, but I need to make a plan to heat that up when I get there, so I either use an oven or bring an air fryer. To reheat and recrisp, set an oven to 400 degrees for about five to 10 minutes, depending on what you're reheating. Let's get that crunch back. You want that dry heat from an oven, an air fryer, but don't use a microwave. If you're looking to sauce things up, do that at the very end, right before serving. To keep those bananas fresher longer, wrap the stem. You can use regular plastic wrap, but I like the sticky stuff. You don't need a lot, just a small piece, and wrap the end. This will prevent it from getting too ripe too quick. Banana could be a good substitute in some recipes. Brownies, some cookies, muffins, and cupcakes. And you can substitute one banana per one egg. Don't let anybody tell you there's a wrong or right way to peel a banana. Started from the bottom, now we're here. If you only want half a banana, don't squeeze, just a quick tug. Two clean halves. If you're in need of a quick ripe banana, turn to your oven. Preheat that oven to 300 degrees. When things are toasty, toss it right in onto the rack. Check on it after five to 10 minutes. What you want is for that peel to be dark brown. You'll wanna let this cool for a few minutes before you use it. The oven's gonna start caramelizing those sugars, making your banana even sweeter. I'm making a giant sub. This is great for prepping ahead or feeding a crowd. Something like sourdough is gonna start with a ton of flavor. I love the smell. Mayo is a classic, but there's so much you can do with sauces and spreads. I like to mix in other flavors like a sriracha or even creamy horseradish for a kick. You can even try a creamy dressing, pesto, or even hummus. The key is more is more. Make sure to do both sides. We are definitely on our way to Flavorville. Who got the meats? The sandwich does. But don't just lay your meat flat, fold it for extra texture. A combination of two or three will tickle your taste buds. Now that's some variety for your palate. When it comes to cheese, a little goes a long way, so stick to one type. For some crunch, you can add spinach, romaine, even arugula, but I'm sticking with a sandwich shop classic, shredded iceberg. My salted tomatoes have been sitting on some paper towels to absorb extra moisture. Ooh, sun-dried tomatoes would be good too. Hmm. Somebody doesn't like tomatoes, you can do a half-half sandwich. 
Now I love the extra bite that onion adds and I just do it with a vegetable peeler. Thin slices. That's a perfect way to avoid extra chopping. And don't forget to season it with salt and pepper. A little grind for a grinder. This looks so good. Dried herbs are a little extra spice work too. Oil and vinegars are a classic, but I have a little twist. Instead of vinegar, I use the juice from peppers or pickles. A little splash is all you need. Top it off with a drizzle. The skies over flavor municipality. Hot dogs are grilling and cookout staples, but you can actually use them to impress all your friends and family. Don't stick to your basic ballpark, Frank. Choose something special. Bacon wrapped dogs or sausages make a great way to upgrade your dog. And mix it up with your buns. Pretzel rolls, brioche rolls, you can even do Hawaiian sweet rolls. I mean, the options are endless. These are some of my favorite, easy to make toppings for hot dogs. For an elote dog, all you need is some charred corn, add a little mayonnaise or Greek yogurt, lime juice, season all that to taste. I like to add a little cumin and a bunch of chopped cilantro. Mix that up, just goes right on top. Some cotilla cheese. Now that looks amazing. If I'm entertaining and wanna save time, I just use pre-made pico de gallo and make a pineapple salsa. Who doesn't love a shortcut? For this tropical inspired hot dog, I'm just gonna glaze on some teriyaki sauce. You can even do this on the grill, caramelize it right on your hot dog. A fresh option is a banh mi dog with a bunch of crisp veggies. Shredded carrot, this isn't cheese. All those vegetables, I can call this healthy, right? When vegetables are super fresh is the right time to preserve them. But for many veggies, you can't just throw them right into the freezer. Blanching in a hot pot of water is the technique you're gonna need. Blanching is a simple technique of quickly cooking in hot water. This process preserves nutrients and color. Before you blanch, you're gonna wanna wash, peel, and chop. Now this is going to be a much more appealing way to store your veggies. Onions and peppers, you can skip the blanching altogether. I get super serious when I chop so I don't lose a finger. Laser focus. Corn, just shuck it, you can leave it on the cob or take it off. 30 seconds in the microwave and it's shucking fantastic. Makes it so much easier. All this corn to shuck, life's always gotta be messing with me. Oh, falling away from me. The water doesn't need to be boiling, just a light simmer. Then just gently add in your vegetables. For most vegetables, just a minute or two will do. You don't even need to cook it all the way through. The other part of this process is to quickly cool everything to set the color and flavor. Just add to a bowl of ice water. If I'm blanching in a big batch, I just go lightest to darkest to preserve the colors. For a smaller dice, you only need 30 seconds to a minute. Since everything's already chopped and prepared, you can just throw it into your favorite recipe or it defrosts really quickly. Get rid of any excess liquid and make sure things are completely cooled. Pack that up into a freezer bag. I like to freeze everything flat, it's less storage and things won't clump up. Bonus, freeze and save those scraps and make stock later. Now these vegetables will be delicious straight from the freezer for several months. Defrosting's always gonna be easier if everything's individually portioned and packaged in its own bag. You just pull what you need and you can get it ready to thaw. I know last minute meals are a thing, but it's always better to plan ahead. The safest and most foolproof way to thaw is gonna be in the refrigerator. In most cases, you're gonna wanna give yourself a 24 hour head start. For those rush jobs, we're gonna use the water technique. If your food isn't already prepackaged, you're gonna wanna put it in a bag before you defrost. Submerge in cold water, never use hot. Replace that water every 30 minutes. The trick is to keep things cold. What's great is when it comes to those vegetables, just cook straight from frozen. And yes, of course, there's the microwave, which works fine for those frozen prepared foods. For those frozen raw foods, the microwave can defrost them evenly and compromise the quality. So it's best to avoid it. These are called the eyes of the pineapple. Pick one that has evenly sized eyes from top to bottom. A telltale sign for a ripe pineapple is tug on that leaf. If it easily comes out, you're good to go. This is important because pineapples won't ripen more once they've been harvested. The natural juices tend to settle in the bottom. So 30 minutes before you're gonna cut into this thing, turn it upside down. And for the assist, I'm gonna use a pitcher. Finally, cut the bottom off. Say aloha to the top. This may seem a bit unconventional, but now we're gonna slice up the whole thing. Last slice, be extra careful. My secret tool, a donut cutter. Just one press will make quick work of making pineapple rings. Now that's a perfect pineapple ring if I've ever seen one. All that's left is slice and enjoy. Pineapple's great on its own, but I like enhancers like chamoy and tahini. Shake it good. Here's an easy way to make three separate meals all at one time. The first step is you're gonna need some foil. For this, I'm gonna need three separate pieces. 
I'm gonna fold these edges together to create three sections. One sheet pan is now three. Now, just separate the chicken. You can do this with beef, shrimp, vegetables, whatever you want. I'm doing this because for my weekly meal prep, I want three different flavors. That way, I don't get tired of the same thing throughout the week. And this is all up to your imagination. Be creative and mix up the flavors. And to save time, I've diced this chicken so it'll cook quicker. More like it's spicy, more spice. There we go. It's all the same ingredient, all the same size, so it'll cook evenly all at once. A meal prep shortcut is having the grocery store help you out with pre-cut ingredients. Frozen vegetables are also another huge time saver. The divider method works great, but alternatively, you can keep your ingredients plain and simple and mix up the flavors by topping them with different sauces. I prepped all the same ingredients, but can have some variety with different flavors throughout the week. And just like that, lunch and dinner for the whole week. The best part about this method is easy cleanup. Here's how to prevent scratches and protect your cookware. One of the simplest, easiest things you can do is just use the right utensils. I prefer a sturdy silicone coated utensil. They can handle high heat and they're pretty durable. And that goes for cleaning, non-abrasive options only. For the majority of my cooking, I prefer to use a durable, long-lasting pan option. One of the most healthiest and durable cookware options is that cast iron skillet. They'll provide some of the best cooking results. All there really is to be concerned about is to clean it properly, so no soap, no dishwasher, and season it from time to time. Stainless steel is one of the most versatile pot or pan options you can have in your kitchen. While there is a bit of a learning curve to make sure things don't stick, they're easy to clean and they'll last you forever, and they can put up with scrapes, bumps, and resist scratches. Moving in a circular motion is just basically stirring and not an effective way to whisk. Beating will work for whipping up egg whites, but it's not really great for other types of whisking. The right way to whisk is just a simple back and forth motion, keeping contact with the bottom of the bowl. For this motion, you don't need to strain. It should be very low effort. This back and forth method is gonna be the best way to emulsify, incorporate, and whip. And just like that, a perfectly emulsified vinaigrette. This motion will force the ingredients to change directions, causing resistance, which will give you better results quicker. Here's how to make perfect hard-boiled eggs. There are many schools of thought, but boiling the water first is gonna be the best method. You'll need enough water to cover your eggs by about an inch. Set your eggs out about 20 minutes before you hard boil them to let them come to room temperature. That water's reached a rapid boil of 212 degrees. Let's add the eggs. Gently lower in the eggs. Make sure the eggs aren't stacked and only in a single layer. Cover and lower the heat. The most important part is time. Perfect hard boiled eggs need to cook between 10 and 12 minutes. Once that timer goes off, remove from heat. These need to be quickly chilled under some cool running water. This helps stop the cooking. No need for a separate ice bath. I just like to add some ice to the cooled pot with water. For the easiest peeling, make sure those eggs are completely cooled. Better yet, if you have time, keep these in the fridge overnight. Here are some tips to make peeling eggs even easier. One thing you can try is add a little baking soda to boiling water before adding in your eggs. That baking soda changes the alkaline levels in the water, helping those egg whites stay separate from the shell. Those eggs will be easier to peel if they're completely cooled. For an individual egg, just gently tap all around. You want small cracks all over the egg. Avoid rolling the egg with your palm on the counter, which could squish the inside. Now just gently remove the shell and the membrane from the egg inside. If you need to crack multiple eggs, you can do them all together. With a little water in the pot, I like to add the lid and give it a rattle. Not too aggressive, just enough to crack the shells and a bowl of water can help with peeling and rinsing. To make a restaurant style burrito, you're gonna want a larger tortilla, at least 12 inches. Most important before you get filling and rolling is warm your tortilla. You can do this directly over a burner, in a dry skillet, or even a few seconds in the microwave. This makes the tortilla more pliable and less brittle. No matter what your favorite fillings are, make sure you have them all ready to make assembly easier. Muy importante, you want to make sure all those ingredients are evenly distributed. For sour cream and guacamole, I like to do a smear of it on so it's all spread out. This is looking like the best burrito already. Let's roll. You want to make sure you have a decent border of tortilla around your fillings. That way you make sure everything fits. I like to tuck everything back into the half of the burrito. 
I'm gonna pick up those sides, flatten it out, pick up the back, tuck everything in, tuck in these corners, and roll her up. Boom, baby! I mean, come on, tens across the board, perfect uniform shape, look at these ends, no tears, this is perfecto. Bonus points, toast the bottom of that burrito in a dry skillet, it'll keep it sealed, and it'll add extra texture. A mango is always easier to cut if it's nice and ripe, so a little soft to the touch and nice and fragrant. Make a cut in the center, all the way around that pit. If that mango's nice and ripe, this should be easy work, just gently twist. Oh, juicy, juicy. And then I like to use a spoon just to scoop everything out. Here's the more traditional method if you're looking for chunks. Cut a little bit off the stem side and cut along the side of that pit. If you feel that pit, cut just on the side of it. Score the mango just down to the skin, not all the way through, and switch to a paring knife or a smaller knife if that works easier for you. Push it out and you'll see all those cubes. You can peel them by hand, that's easy. Eat it right out of the skin or use your knife. Another trick you can try is once you have the half of the mango, use a cup to peel it. The cup's gonna act like a big spoon. Scoop it right out. Ta-da! Here's some extra ways you can use a peeler. There's a blade on both sides, so speed up peeling and use a back and forth motion. Instead of one motion at a time, use a back and forth. Look at that, already done. Veggie noodles are so trendy, but you don't need a spiralizer. You can make vegetable ribbons just with your peeler. This is zoodles of fun and no special knife skills needed. Thin strips or wider ribbons. Or use this method for paper thin slices. It helps to give it a quarter turn every slice. This will be the perfect vessel to store and preserve herbs in the freezer. Strip your herbs from the stem. You can chop them or leave them whole. You can keep the herbs separate or do a mixture. To keep these delicious herbs protected in the freezer, you need olive oil. Just enough to cover. I love an ice cube tray with a lid. It makes storing and stacking way easier. Basil and parsley are a bit more delicate, so store basil as pesto, or I like to make scampi butter out of parsley. You just need softened butter, add in your parsley, a ton of minced garlic, lemon zest. The juice gets away with it every time. Oh, there we go. Sprinkle of salt. Mix that all together. Load up that tray. But it can only get better with garlic. I'm gonna fill the rest up with pesto. Once these are frozen, you can pull out individual portions, throw them into pasta, seafood, whatever you want. Just pop this in your skillet to add extra flavor. An ice cube tray is a great way to freeze and save individual portions of stock or your favorite sauces. Keep your cubes stored airtight and they should last three to four months. This deliciousness will be waiting for me right in the freezer. Once they're solid, you can save space by transferring them to a freezer bag. Just remove the air and label it. I always have meals ready to go in the freezer for hectic weeks. So when I have time, I prep meals for when I don't have time. To make a meal kit, you just need a freezer bag and any combination of ingredients goes. It's as easy as choosing a protein or not. Chicken, sausage, beef, all work great. Add in vegetables and literally any sauce will do. Combine your ingredients in the bag and you're good to go. This is gonna be a vegetable curry with chickpeas, some potato, broccoli, and a jar of curry sauce. Love that noise. This one's gonna be a pot pie soup. Corn, peas and carrots, potatoes, celery. You can really take inspiration from anywhere. I saw this pot pie sauce at the store and thought, make a freezer meal. The sound is so pleasant. <laughs> I want this to be a soup, so I'm gonna add some stock and use it to clean out this jar. Get all that goodness out of there. Last but not least, the chicken. Pastas also are great for make-ahead meals. Pasta right in the bag. The sausage smells good. For this kit, I'm packing my sauce and veggies separate. I am a big fan of reusable bags. They really cut down on waste. This is so versatile, you can mix up your favorite flavors and seasonings. Do this for soups, stews, and chilies. Ooh, say that five times fast. Trust me, a meal kit will save you. You just grab it, there's no hassle, you don't even need to think about it. For even less effort, prepare your meal kit in a crock pot, pressure cooker, or even in the oven. When I'm hosting, I like to make a game plan of all the dishes I'm creating and how to serve them. Mini dishes can be made ahead of time, heated up, and kept warm in the oven. 
Other dishes that you make on the stove top, you don't want to keep on the heat too long because the bottom could scorch or they might dry out. So I prefer a gentler heating method to keep food hot all party long. Put those crock pots to work to serve food and many crock pots can be so inexpensive. This is gonna keep these taters nice and warm. So you probably only have one slow cooker. If you're hosting a party, borrow from friends, neighbors, and family coming over so you have extra vessels to keep all your food warm. That's why you plan ahead. Ah, coming in clutch. I needed an extra, so I borrowed this from my friend Marielle. Even a rice cooker is great to keep things warm. Not just for rice. Oh yeah, that's heating up. Even a heating pad can work to keep your food warm. Take that in the high gear and make sure it's on a heat safe surface. Cover that up with a nice kitchen towel. That's pigs in a blanket on a blanket. The height of culinary presentation. I give that two and a half Michelin stars. And the reigning champion for keeping food warm at a buffet, the chafing dish. Honestly, these things are amazing. You can use them for so many different events. They're built to last like a rock. I know you're asking, where's the beef? One tip for setting these up, fill it with water that's already hot. Now that will give you a good head start. Sterno's easy to find, really inexpensive to keep that buffet hot. It's so easy, what you bake in, you can serve in. That steam is a gentle, even heat to keep everything nice and hot. A long pair of chopsticks or cooking chopsticks can actually be a versatile kitchen tool. You use them the same way you use regular tongs and when you get good at it, it can actually give you more precision. You can use them for preparing foods instead of a fork, use them to beat eggs. Whip it and whip it good. I love learning new techniques and using new tools in the kitchen. These are wooden and safe to use on any cookware. You may think this is a lot of butter. Yes, because I don't want these eggs to stick. Nice, buttery, fluffy eggs. And they can be a great helpful tool for sauteing and pan frying. These are also a great tool if you're working with pasta. These can really work like a pair of tweezers when you're looking for precision making your recipe. Now that's what I call precision in the kitchen. The next time you're slicing up apples, here's a tip you can use to keep them from turning brown. The first thing you're gonna wanna do is prepare a salt water mixture. That's one teaspoon of salt for every two cups of water. Then slice up your apples and add them right to the salt water. These will need to soak for about five minutes. The salt water will prevent them turning brown, but not make them taste salty. Alternatively, you can use a lemon water solution. I like to roll my lemons first, that makes them extra juicy. Juicy, juicy. Doesn't matter if you get the seeds in there. These may seem like a gimmick, but they save a lot of time slicing. And you can add these apples right into the lemon water. Let these soak for a few minutes and you have apples that won't turn brown. Now these are ready for your sack lunch or meal prep. Use what you have and make your own tofu press. I like to use two similar size containers. Turn one upside down, tofu goes on top, and the trick is even pressure to squeeze out all that liquid. You can weigh this down with something heavy like a skillet or a big can. And after about 20 minutes, all that extra liquid is out of your tofu. If you're letting this sit for longer, keep it in the fridge. Getting that excess liquid out is the key to firm, crispy tofu in your recipe. Here's the right way to open a bottle of wine. The first thing is we have to get through this foil seal. And here's a method I like that doesn't require a knife. With a firm grip, just twist that seal and pull off. Now, let's get this cork out of here. For this style of wine opener, position the corkscrew right in the center of the cork. Now keeping everything straight, just twist straight down. And these arms give you the leverage you need to pull straight up. Gently pull and rock, just like that. But the traditional tool is a wine key or a waiter's corkscrew. If you do need to cut that foil seal off, just be sure to do it below the top lip. This just ensures that the wine never touches the seal. Firmly grip the bottle and place that corkscrew in the center of the cork. Keeping it straight, just twist down. Stop just before the end of the corkscrew. Now tilt the wine key and position the opener. Now gently begin to lift that cork. Partially pull up the cork and reposition the wine key. Many wine keys have two stages of opening, so pull that cork up. Now to fully remove that cork, just gently rock and twist. Then you wanna give the cork a sniff. If it smells like the wine, you're good to go. If it has an odor, you may wanna open another bottle. Of course you can boil eggs in water, but let's get things hot and steamy. You only need about an inch of water in the bottom and bring it up to a gentle boil. And it's best to start with room temperature eggs. 
place those over the simmering water and let it go. For the perfect soft boil egg, set a timer for six minutes. That's six minutes and immediately remove it from heat. Steaming will be more gentle and prevent cracking. Quickly shock those eggs in cold water to stop them from cooking. Soft boiled eggs are gonna be ideal for ramen, salads, or just a snack. Steaming also makes a more tender egg because it cooks evenly and consistently. My shortcut when I don't have a lot of time, fully cooked bacon. I keep cooked bacon in the freezer to save me time on busy days. So this is gonna go back in the fridge for a lovely Sunday breakfast. We're gonna bake our eggs for our breakfast sandwich. For the right size egg, I'm gonna take a piece of foil and form it over our bagel. This works great for English muffins and even croissants. And don't forget a little kitchen spray. You can even do this omelet style with your favorite veggies. Just pour that right in. Do I have the right technique? Let's get it cracking. While these bake in the oven, I have time to get other things done, like finish getting ready. I need to brush them. Eggs are ready. No yolk, this fits perfect. I like a BLT breakfast sandwich with bacon, some lettuce or spinach, and tomato. That's a tasty breakfast bagel. I just need to add some cream cheese, I think. Mm. Everything bagel avocado toast is delicious too. Here's how to freeze and save your fresh baked bread. If you picked up a loaf and it's hot and fresh, make sure it's completely cool before we get wrapping. Portioning is key here. Keep what you're gonna use right away. We're gonna save the rest. I'm gonna slice this up to use over the next couple weeks. I'll be transparent with you. You just need to wrap it really tightly. So tight. A double wrap for extra safety. Don't wait, store that extra bread right away while it's fresh and soft. Keeping things airtight will prevent freezer burn and preserve all that goodness. Load up a freezer bag, label it, and you're good to go. Now all that dough's not gonna go to waste. Took off, just move it to the fridge overnight. Should be good to go by the morning. Larger pieces may take a little extra time. Sliced bread is ideal. Just remove the pieces you want. They'll thaw quickly or just pop them straight into the toaster. Bread can last up to six months in the freezer. After about two months, the texture can change a little bit, so it's ideal to use for French toast or even bread pudding. If I'm making pancakes or waffles, I double that batter so I can save extra for later. Of course, you can use that full-size waffle iron, but I love a mini waffle iron. It's the perfect size for a quick breakfast. Hot and fresh. I'm gonna enjoy this right now and pack the rest up for later. The hardest part of this process is just making sure these are completely cool before packaging them up. That'll eliminate moisture and condensation in the bag. Just load up your favorite freezer bag. I pushed out the air, labeled it, and these can go right in the freezer. These will be perfect in the freezer up to three months. When it comes to waffles, it's hard to let go. Straight from the freezer, load up your waffles, you have breakfast in no time. From casseroles to your favorite baked goods, you just don't want to throw those bare in your back seat. So protect that precious cargo so it makes it to its final destination, delicious and intact. I like to make sure anything I'm transporting to a party or event is in a microwave safe dish or something I can pop into the oven to heat up. Let your dish slightly cool and then loosely cover it. This helps avoid buildup of extra steam and condensation. This helps retain heat, but that extra moisture can escape. For packing everything up, I love an option like a collapsible crate or even a cardboard box. Any kind of container you have laying around the house can work. Line with a towel to help pad everything out. That'll help protect everything and soak up any potential splashes. And some cardboard to make layers for stacking. Another towel to insulate and prevent clanking. Tuck that right in there. I'll read you a story on the drive. And don't forget any serving utensils you may need. Even use a cooler. It works for hot food, it's insulated, and will help protect all those recipes. Don't forget those tools. Ready to go. Some slow cookers are made to move with a latching system. Others are not, but we can fix that. Cover for an extra layer of protection. Careful if yours is hot. Now rubber bands are the hero to keep that lid in place. Stretch Armstrong. Reed Richards. Toit as a toyga. I also like to pack this in a crate or a box. It's added protection and it will prevent it from sliding around. Mm -hmm. Easy peasy. 
Pies and baked goods can also be tricky. I like to use a container with sides that's roughly the same size. I have this in the garage. It's the perfect size. I just gave it a wash. You can use a towel to line the bottom, but better yet, I like a piece of grippy shelf liner. Not going anywhere. Some wax paper or parchment to protect the top, just loosely covered the last line of defense. I'm not baking bunts every day, but this pan can help you with your corn game. A bunt pan is gonna be the perfect vessel here. Place the cob in the center, and you'll need a good sharp knife. Just be careful when you reach the end to avoid damaging the pan. Well, this doesn't shuck. I also try to leave a little bit of the stem intact for stability. This is really easy. It's got me feeling like a freak on a leash. This is the perfect pan to keep those kernels from falling away from me. If you don't have a bunt pan, you can achieve the same thing with two bowls, a smaller one and a larger one. These can be any two types of bowls. You can even do this with a bowl upside down in a baking dish. And we're catching kernels, not feelings. Now this makes me want to make cornbread in my bunt pan. Here's some cool tricks to separate egg yolks. This is more like a magic trick, but you use garlic to pick up an egg yolk with your fingers. Rub that garlic all over your clean fingers. Here goes nothing. This isn't the most practical way to separate egg yolks, but it is fun, and I've had success with eggs with darker yolks. A little less messy and foolproof method is a water bottle, but it's gotta be empty. Okay, there we go. Ah, almost there. Not a world record, but I did it. Now it's just as easy as making a suction. Instead of buying it from the store, I'm gonna show you how to make your own freezer meals. I like to bake the bacon to make it extra crispy. For the best scrambled eggs, let's use some low heat. That'll make them fluffier, and they cook more evenly. I like to give these tortillas a little toast. These breakfast burritos are simple, easy, and delicious. Making your own, you can control the ingredients and make each burrito exactly how you want it. These are so cute and little, great for a weekday breakfast. Season everything how you like it. This is a much better alternative than what you can buy at the store. But still just as easy. For the amount of time you can make one burrito, you can make enough for a week. You can also do make-ahead breakfast sandwiches or overnight oats. Meal prep is all about having options. And finally, just wrap each one individually. That way they're ready to grab whenever you need one. To prepare all of these, it only took about 30 minutes. Make as many as you want, because the great thing is you can freeze these and they'll last for several weeks. Make sure anything that you're freezing, that you label it with what it is and the date. Having them wrapped in foil also makes it so easy to reheat them in the oven. To cook rice, you usually use a ratio of two to one. But here's a trick so you never have to measure again. And the secret is right at your fingertips. Pour in the rice. Make sure to rinse your rice first. This will help to remove some of that excess starch. Do this a few times until that water is mostly clear. There we go, all ready. Now to add the right amount of water. Touch your finger just to the top of the rice. Now add water until it reaches your first knuckle. All right, there we go. This works in rice cookers or a pot on the stove. Couldn't be easier than that. Even if you're not an avid baker, a rolling pin is a good tool to keep around. Use a rocking motion to crush. Just like that, we're ready for a sundae. Ooh, so refreshing. I like to keep everything in a zip bag to avoid making a mess. And turn this into cracker crumb. Crust for a cheesecake and I didn't need to use a food processor. And this is my favorite way to use a rolling pin. It's to pound and flatten meat. I prefer this over a mallet because there's more surface area. Plus, this is a tool you probably already have in your kitchen. But if you don't, try a wine bottle. A wine bottle's the perfect shape for rolling out dough. Just be careful, this is glass after all. Grilled cheese is traditionally made with butter, but you may omit it. All right, I do love butter, but mayo is less greasy. It'll add a flavorful richness to your grilled cheese and it's bread so easy. You can keep it basic with American or cheddar cheese, or you can get funky with fancy cheese. I have a smoked Gruyere here, anything you want. Grilled cheese is a quick and easy meal, but when it comes to that fire, it should be low and slow. 
Keeping the temperature low will mean the cheese will melt on the inside before the outside is brown and crispy. Once that pan is warm, I like to toast the inside of the bread, the side without mayo on it. Toasting the inside will give your sandwich more texture and help melt that cheese. Now you can add your cheese. I like mine to hang over a little bit so it'll get brown and crispy in the skillet. Add the other slice, mayo side up. Once one side is golden brown, give it a flip. Oh, gorgeous! By using plain mayonnaise and adding flavors, you can make your own fancy spiced up sauces at home. A standard go-to recipe just uses lemon and garlic. A little lemon zest, that's the best part of the lemon, I think. Garlic, you can use a micro plane or finely mince it. This is a huge clove. Just a little juice and season that up. A little bit of pepper. Easy aioli is really flexible. You can make as little or as much as you want. I wish I had a little tiny baby whisk. Fresh herbs also work great in aioli. I'm gonna finely dice all this up, but you could use a chopper or a blender to combine this into a smooth sauce. Just add those herbs. I love capers. See, fancy. A little briny, a little salty. This is a great way to use up some extra ingredients you have in the fridge. Now that's packed full of flavor. Different seasonings and spice blends also work perfect. The trick is to toast those spices in a dry skillet over low heat until fragrant. Oh, it smells amazing. This is curry powder. Other spice blends will work really well. I also like smoked paprika. About once a week, I take out everything that needs to be used up in the fridge and take a look at it from a new perspective. One of my go-to ways to use up ingredients is make fried rice. This is the perfect dish to use up those last few eggs in the carton. This is a great way to use up any little bit of vegetables you have. Chop them up, throw them in. Some leftover proteins. You can do this just as a leftover stir fry, but I always have rice on hand, so fried rice it is. The same idea works so well if you have leftover pasta. Just add your noodles, all your ingredients, and your favorite sauce. Little soy sauce, sesame oil right at the end, carrot for color. Now mix everything together. With all your ingredients prepared, this should take under 10 minutes. I hope Uncle Roger doesn't come for me. Easy, fancy, and no one would know it's just leftovers. If you don't wanna cook anything over the stove, just heat up any leftover proteins you have, chop up your ingredients, and make a protein bowl. drizzle of your favorite sauce or dressing. Colorful, delicious remix meal. I love stuffed peppers and thought, why not make a breakfast version? All right, let's get prepared, pepper, peppered. Let's get prepared, let's get cooking. You can just cut the top off, but I like to core out the stem, just like your Halloween pumpkin. Set that aside for compost. Clean out those guts. Once they're cleaned out, make sure they sit flat and stable. If the pepper doesn't sit flat, you can trim a little bit off the bottom to make sure it's stable. This is the fun and easy part. You just need eggs and your favorite fillings. You'll need two to three eggs per pepper. You can add in ham or sausage, just make sure they're pre-cooked. I think I'm too cheesy sometimes. <laughs> never, never. Season to taste, crack a lacking. And now for a little ASMR. If you're doing this for a crowd, everyone can customize with their own favorite ingredients. An entire bag of spinach turns into this. What are you gonna do? Eggs will puff up when cooking, so leave a little room at the top. You can even make these ahead and use it as a meal prep. Lots of veggies for breakfast. Let's get down, let's get down to baking. At 375, these took about 40 to 45 minutes and the eggs are set. Since buying in bulk is such a good value, why let any go to waste? Nuts are great to store in the freezer to prolong their shelf life. I usually have nuts left over from holiday baking, so the rest goes right into the freezer. Anything you store in the freezer should be sealed in an airtight container or bag. Always label and date. Nuts from the freezer, you can just remove what you want, put the rest back, and they thaw super quick. If you buy flour in bulk, you can actually keep it in the freezer. Especially for dry goods, you want to keep moisture, odors, and flavors out. You'll keep all that out if it's airtight. You can even freeze your wild oats. 
And since we're talking about the freezer, let this be a reminder that bananas can go in there too. I always keep these in the freezer before they get too ripe for banana ice cream and smoothies. Dry goods in the freezer should last up to a year when stored properly. Instead of letting it dry out and grow mold in the refrigerator, store extra in the freezer. If it's a whole block, portion it out into pieces that you can use up all at once. Just wrap each bundle up tightly to prevent freezer burn. You can even do a double wrap. Pack it up, date it, freeze it. For sliced cheeses, you'll want some parchment in between. This, of course, will help you remove pieces as you need them. Store that in a freezer bag and be sure to label it. Pre-shredded cheese, I like to keep in a single layer so it doesn't clump up. Just be sure to remove all that air. If you're shredding cheese fresh from the block, I'm still, I'm still Kobe from the block. It helps to add a little cornstarch. A little sprinkle will prevent everything from sticking together and it helps if the cheese is really cold. Cheese! Now it's ready for the freezer. Into the bag. One layer. Freezing is gonna work best for firmer cheeses like cheddar, jack, and even low moisture mozzarella. Fresh cheeses with more water content are best used quickly and not frozen. If you portion your cheese, a smaller block should thaw quickly overnight in the refrigerator. Slices and shredded, forget about it. Those will thaw in no time. If packaged properly, cheese will last up to nine months in this frigid environment. I grew up on these. You know, the gateway snack to charcuterie. I mean, the grocery store has cheese, deli meat, and crackers, which is all you need to get started. A bento box style container is perfect for a snackable lunch. The dividers and sections help keep everything separate. This is the perfect way to control the quality of ingredients and pack exactly the ingredients you want. Mmm, spicy cheese. And of course, by making your own snackable lunch, you can save money and get more out of it. Choose one deli meat, you can even mix them up. This also is the perfect way to control your own portion sizes. Hey, and why not add in some fruit and veggies? Sometimes I even substitute cucumber rounds instead of crackers. If you don't have a bento box, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 containers, but all I need is one. Here's how to divide up just about any container. With baking cups, it's a piece of cake. Now that's cute and delicious. Travel containers are the perfect solution to pack small amounts of condiments. Just make sure it's a food safe plastic. There are so many options to pack your own snackable lunch. If you're making homemade cookies, consider even doubling the recipe so you can save more for later. Just about any of your favorite cookie dough recipes are ideal for freezing. Follow the recipe like normal, but instead of the oven, these are getting a Han Solo treatment. They're gonna get the carbonite. It's really just a freezer. A scoop is the winning tool here. Portion that dough into individual balls. Let these chill and firm up in the fridge before we pack them up. I like to use a reusable freezer bag. Ah, now these are nice and firm and won't smush together. Load it up for later. Write down the type of cookie, the temperature, and that bake time. Just gonna wrap that up. Instead of writing on the bag, I can throw this right in. Get as much air out as you can and seal it up. Now the bounty is ready for the freezer. If you're gonna do cutout cookies like sugar cookies, freeze the dough all at once. Wrap it up tightly, form it into a flat disc, double wrap it to make sure it stays airtight, Label it and date it. When you guessed it, toss it in the freezer. When it's cookie time, just let this thaw overnight in the refrigerator, roll it out, stamp it, bake it. Those freezer cookies will last up to three months. You can have cookies on hand whenever you want them and bake exactly what you need, uh, one extra. You can bake straight from the freezer. They just may need an extra minute or two. Go ahead and freeze those baked cookies too. Just be sure those cookies are cool before you pack them away. And there's only one way to find out. Oh, so cool. Layer them in a container between parchment paper. That paper will keep them from sticking together and a hard container will keep them from getting crushed. In the freezer, these will last a couple months. Nothing like a fresh baked cookie. Nom, 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 nom